Well, as we make our way through the Gospel of Luke, and we listen to the truths that Jesus is continually preaching and teaching to his disciples, it's easy for us to lose track of where Jesus is in his three-and-a-half-year ministry. But we need to remember as we come to our text this morning in Luke 18, that ever since Luke chapter 9, Jesus' ministry has been, well, before that, it's been based in Galilee. But now it's coming to a close. In fact, since chapter 9, it has come to a close and he's been going somewhere. Before Luke chapter 9, we, we saw Jesus spending his time teaching and healing and casting out demons in the northern region of Galilee. He'd begun calling people to be his disciples. You remember this back in Luke chapter 5 and Luke chapter, yeah, Luke chapter 5, you have Peter and James and John being called from their fishing boats to follow Jesus. And then later on, you see Matthew, the tax collector, being called to follow Jesus. But then you come to Luke chapter 9, specifically verse 18, and you see that something happens that would lead to a crucial shift in Jesus' ministry. Now, I want you to turn back with me to Luke chapter 9 just for a moment. Because what was that, that, that event, that moment, that set off this crucial shift from Jesus' ministry there in Galilee to what came next? Luke chapter 9, verse 18. We get a running start here. It says in verse 18, And it happened... As he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, Well, John the Baptist. But some say, Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And what's the answer of Jesus' own disciples? Now well, Peter, probably as a spokesman, comes to him and he says, you're the Christ of God. In other words, the disciples of Jesus, after listening to his teaching and seeing him healing the sick and casting out demons and raising the dead and demonstrating his miraculous power even over creation itself, the disciples of Jesus have realized that this is not just any teacher. This is not just any prophet. This isn't just any miracle worker. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior that the Old Testament scriptures had promised would deliver God's people from all of their enemies. This is the Son of Man, which Daniel 7.14 says will come and rule and reign over all people groups, over all nations, over all languages, whose kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom which would never be destroyed. This is the one whose kingdom all of human history is marching toward, before whom Philippians 2.10 says every person's knee will one day bow, and before whom every person's tongue will one day confess that he is Lord. This is the one who is standing right here in the middle of this small group of disciples at this moment in Luke 9 verse 20. But in the very next verse, what does the Christ, the promised Messiah of God, command his disciples? Don't tell anyone. What? <laughs> because my purpose being here right now is not to set up my kingdom. What does Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of Man say is going to happen in verse 22? I'm not going to come set up my kingdom now. But here's what I am going to do. He says in verse 22, I must, the Son of Man must. In other words, it is necessary 
that I suffer many things and be rejected by the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. And immediately after he says that, he ties what's going to happen to him together with what is expected of those who follow him. Because what does Jesus go on to say in verse 24? Essentially, he's saying, and if you want to come after me, if you want to be connected with and affiliated with God's promised Messiah and Savior, you must deny yourself. You must daily take up your cross, dying to your own way of life and your own desires, and you must follow me. He goes on in verse 24, he says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Verse 26 says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, right, both are necessary, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's glory and of the holy angels. But that's not why Jesus is here right now. It's not to come in glory. It's not to come and set up his kingdom with the holy angels coming with him. That's not why he's here at this time. And now that his disciples have discovered his true identity, you find just a few verses later in Luke 9, 51, that Jesus' ministry from this moment on changes. The time has come for Jesus, it says there in verse 51, to be taken up, to be received up into heaven. But before that happens... Jesus must accomplish the critical mission that he had been sent at this time by the Father to do. And this mission would be accomplished where? In Jerusalem. So as we come to our text now in Luke 18, verse 31, we discover something, right? Back in chapter 9, it's like that journey began, and that journey you know, it was not just a step-by-step a -step closer to Jerusalem kind of journey. It was kind of like a, a, a wandering, meandering journey with, with intentionality of, of proclaiming that Jesus is coming through. You need to receive him. But Jesus had his face set toward Jerusalem from Luke chapter 9, verse 51, all the way up to this point here in Luke 18, verse 31. And in Luke 18, verse 31, we discover something. They are almost there. They are almost to Jerusalem. It's right here. It's just around the corner. So what does he say here, beginning in verse 31? Jesus, he takes the twelve aside and he says to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in a higher elevation. Every, everywhere in the, in the country was considered lower than Jerusalem. So they're going up to Jerusalem. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. He will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Several details I want you to notice here. First of all, what is about to happen to Jesus is going to fulfill Scripture. He says that all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man, speaking of himself, will be accomplished. Now the Old Testament prophets, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, had prophesied about a servant of the Lord, all right, we read about this in Isaiah 52 and 53. A servant of the Lord who would one day be exalted, he would be lifted up, but who would first face suffering and death. 
All right, and again, just reminding us of what we read earlier this morning. In Isaiah 52, verse 14, it says that his appearance would be marred more than any man. And, Luke, and, and Isaiah 53 goes on to say that he would be despised and rejected. He would be afflicted, oppressed. He would be bruised. He would be wounded. He would receive stripes, right? This is like, this isn't like, you know, paint or any kind of other, this is whipping, flogging, beating, stripes, and he would be cut off from the land of the living. You compare that with what Jesus is saying here in verse 32 of Luke 18. Jesus says, for he, again the Son of Man, Jesus himself, will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted, and spit upon. He will be scourged, right? Receive stripes, and be killed. Just like Isaiah and other prophets have prophesied, Jesus confirms what the prophets had written about the Son of Man would be accomplished. It's like he's grabbing all of his disciples' faces and saying, look, that's Jerusalem right over there, right? Just... Not a day's journey from where they are, right there, near Jericho. We're almost there. This is going to happen. Just like the Old Testament prophets said it would. It's all going to be fulfilled. So what is about to happen to Jesus? The mockery, the mistreatment, the scourging, the killing of Jesus, first of all, would fulfill Old Testament scripture. But secondly, notice who Jesus says will be involved in all of these things. It says, for he will be delivered to who? To the Gentiles. Now that's different than the group of people Jesus said would be involved with these things back in Luke 9 verse 22. Who in Luke 9, 22 did Jesus say would be involved in his suffering and his rejection and his death? Well, the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, are these Gentiles he's talking about? Who are these? They're Jews. So when you take both of these passages, Luke 9, 22 and, and Luke 18, 32, and you put them together, who is going to be involved in the suffering and death of Jesus? Everybody! Jew and Gentile. The Jews would reject Jesus. They would deny him before the Gentile governor Pilate. Right? The chief priest would bring him before him and say, you know, <laughs> Crucify him! We have no king but Caesar! And the Gentile governor would order the mistreatment of Jesus at the hand of his Gentile Roman soldiers, followed by his crucifixion on a Gentile cross. Now we'll look at a very insightful verse in about six months when we get to Luke 23. Because in Luke 23 verse 12, we're told that on that very day, when Jesus is brought before Pilate, Pilate, right, Roman governor, and Herod, right, ruler of Judea, became friends. For previously they had been at enmity with one another. Why is that significant? It's significant because the death of Jesus and the suffering of Jesus would be accomplished by two enemies coming together as friends to carry out the mistreatment and the execution of God's Messiah. The different factions of the world would suspend their hatred of each other and they would band together in their hatred of Jesus, the Son of Man, so that he might be destroyed. Now, that sounds kind of familiar if you look at what Jesus tells his disciples in John chapter 15. If the world hates you, what does that mean? Well, 
guess what? It hated me first. And not just the Gentile world, but the Jewish world too. And finally, Jesus says that on the third day following his suffering and death, he would rise again. He would really die. Right? There, there are certain religious sects or religions altogether that say, oh, Jesus just fainted there on the cross and uh, they buried him, but he really wasn't really dead because um, that would explain things better. Uh, if you know the kind of flogging that people who went to the cross uh, experienced, and the kind of people who are professional Roman killers responsible for this thing, they, they know what death looks like. Right? And you see that the proof that Scripture offers when they go to break the knees, because, you know, Sabbath is coming, and they go to break the knees of the two criminals on Jesus' side, and they come to Jesus, and it's like, oh, he's already dead. And just to make sure, they shove a spear up into his side, and what comes out? Blood and water. He was dead, friends. He was dead, dead. And he would lay dead in a tomb for three days, but he would not stay dead. Now, Jesus has demonstrated already in Luke's gospel his power to raise others. Right? In Luke chapter 7, we saw Jesus raised to life the son of a widow. Remember the widow of Nain? He's been carried out on the funeral bier. He's dead. His grieving mother, a widow, walking beside him. And Jesus stops the bier and he says, Don't weep. And he touches the man. And the man rises up. We see in Luke chapter 8, Jesus raises a 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, who had just died a short time before that. But what if the one who has power to raise others from the dead is himself dead? Does that prove a bit of a difficulty? <laughs> you might think so. But not when the one who is dead is also the Son of God. Jesus, the third day following his death, would rise again. So now, let me ask you. If you're one of, 12, uh, of Jesus' 12 closest disciples listening to what Jesus is saying here, how would you respond? Right? You see what he's saying? He's saying, hey, we're, we're almost to Jerusalem. It's right there. Right? You, can, you can see it there at the, the edge of the clouds there. We're going there. We'll be there in about a day or two. And I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be insulted. I'm going to be spit on. I'm going to be whipped and flogged and killed. How would you respond? Now, this is the guy you've been following for about three years here. You've seen his power. You've seen what he's capable of. It's been revealed to you from God that this is the Messiah. How would you feel? Would you be afraid? Would you be concerned? I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be happy, except maybe about the rising again part. But how did the disciples of Jesus react to what Jesus is telling them? It's really interesting what it says here in verse 34. It says, but they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which are spoken. Now, I mean, you, you read these words. There's nothing about the actual words of Jesus that would have been difficult for his disciples to understand. I mean, they know who Gentiles are. They know what mocking sounds like. They know what spit looks like. They've probably seen or at least heard about Roman floggings. And of course, they're all aware of the concept of death. I mean, what about this doesn't make sense? Because for whatever reason, they could not understand how these terrible things 
and Jesus could have anything in common. Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, he was the promised Savior. How can Jesus, the most important historical figure in human history, suffer and die? Now, in the past, my family has gone up north several times to visit my wife's grandparents. And on New Year's Eve, you, you've probably seen this, the local news channel has a special feature reviewing all of the celebrities who have died that year. You've probably seen that or heard about it on the radio or something like that. Well, as the list begins to play, you know, most of the faces and names that I see there are pretty unfamiliar. It's like, I have no, no clue who these people are. But occasionally, I'll see a face of a very well-known actor, a very popular musician, and I'll find myself thinking, wait a second, he died? He was the best actor! And of course you know that your favorite actor or musician isn't going to live forever, but it's almost like you just can't really believe he's actually dead! Now, it's difficult to know exactly what the disciples were experiencing in that moment. We don't know what thoughts were going through their heads as they're listening to Jesus reveal to them that this time of suffering and death is really close. All we know is that they are not able to comprehend what they are hearing. It just does not make sense to them. And, and maybe that's perhaps because there might be something more going on here than simply their inability to comprehend what Jesus is telling them. Because you notice in verse 34, it says, they understood none of these things. And notice the next part. The saying was hidden from them. It's possible that at this time, the significance of what Jesus was about to suffer was being divinely concealed from Jesus' disciples. Almost as if God, in his perfect salvation plan, was withholding from Jesus' disciples the ability to see the significance of what the promised Savior was about to do until later. In fact, Jesus himself tells his disciples in John 16, verse 32, that his disciples are going to be scattered, leaving Jesus alone. When Jesus is betrayed and arrested, they are all going to abandon him. Now, does that sound like a group of people who understand the significance of what Jesus is doing? Doesn't sound like that to me. <laughs> because it would not be until they saw the risen Jesus that they truly would understand what Jesus had suffered and died to accomplish. So right now, they're in this area of, of, of confusion. They're, they're not making sense of what Jesus is saying it might be just because they're astounded that this could possibly happen to the Messiah of the world, or it might be because God is actually revealing the significance until later. But right now, and I think this is the imagery that we're, we're meant to see here, it's as if they are blind to the significance of what Jesus is going to do and to experience when he arrives in Jerusalem. And it's that that the idea of that blindness that they're experiencing to what Jesus is saying, which makes the following verses so appropriate. Because you read in verse 35, they come across someone as they're entering into Jericho who shares something in common with them. Verse 35, it says, Then it happened as he is coming near Jer uh, Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him something. What did they tell him? Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. 
I, I think it's pretty clear from what happens next that this man has obviously heard about Jesus. I mean, it's been three and a half years. Word has gotten around about who this guy is. And this man sitting here who's, who spent his life begging has heard about the man who makes the lame walk. And who cleanses the leper. And who causes the deaf to hear. Who raises the dead. And specifically of importance to him. Who causes the blind to see. He's heard about that man by now. So when he hears the sudden increase of voices. And the loud growing sounds of the thuds of many feet on the stony road. And, and, and that meaning of all this noise was because Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. All this blind man could think was, this might be my only chance. Of course, what is the greatest obstacle this man has? He can't see. So how is he going to make his way to where Jesus is? He's never heard Jesus' voice before, probably. So he can't follow that. He probably wouldn't be able to get anyone to take him by the hand and lead him to Jesus in time. So if he can't find his way to Jesus, what's the only option that remains to him? He needs Jesus to come to him. And the only way he might possibly get Jesus to come to him is if he gets Jesus' attention. And what's the best way to get someone's attention? Jesus! Son of David! Have mercy on me. I want you to see if you can guess something. I want you to guess how many times in Luke's gospel the title Son of David is used. How many times do you think? It's not a lot. In fact, you can hold up the number on one hand. Two times. In this passage, you see it twice but also in one more passage. I want you to turn to that second passage in Luke chapter 20, just a few pages over. In Luke 20, verse 41, we see something very significant in connection with the title, Son of David. In Luke chapter 20, verse 41, you know, in the context there, he's just, Jesus has just had a, number of, a series of arguments or a, Discussions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. And you come to verse 41, and Jesus then turns the tables on the scribes, and he asks them a question. What does he ask them? He says, how can they say that the Christ is the son of David? Now, we're not going to answer that question until we get to that passage. But what does that question imply? It implies that many people believed that the Messiah, or in Greek, the Christ, would be a descendant of David. So when a blind man, in Luke chapter 18, starts crying out, calling Jesus the son of David... What is the blind man saying that he believes Jesus to be? He believes him to be the Messiah. And he is begging that the man whom he believes to be the Messiah might have mercy on him. He knows that this Jesus as Messiah is far above his lowly station. He's a beggar. He's a blind man. He's an outcast. He, he lives outside the city most of the time, sitting on the side of the road, begging for people who just take heart on him and give him a few pennies. 
He knows that he is undeserving of any kindness that Jesus might show toward him. But this blind man also knows that if the reports about this Jesus are true, this Jesus is the only one who can cause his blind eyes to see. The only one. And so he breaks all social norms. He ignores any cultural expectations. And he lets out a cry to the only one who could deliver him from his darkness. But society quickly uh, lets him know that he's out of place. Because in verse 39, what's the reaction of those who are between him and Jesus? Be quiet! Stop shouting! You shouldn't do that! It's not acceptable. But friend, if you are desperate to be delivered from the darkness that you are bound in, and your only hope of deliverance is within the sound of your voice, are you going to bite your tongue because crying out is not socially acceptable? Well, this blind man sure doesn't think so. When those who went before him warned him that he should be quiet, what did the blind man do? It says, he cried out, All the more! <laughs> Son of David! Have mercy on me! I'm not going to stop until he hears me! And what does Jesus do? He stops. He stands still. And he commands that this blind man be brought to him. Blind man comes near and Jesus asks him and he says, What do you want me to do for you? What a good question. What a glorious question. And you know what he's going to ask, right? He says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus says to him, Well, I'll think about it. He says, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And I, I always am astounded by the, the Greek word that he uses there because it's literally the word your faith has saved you. And this is the fourth time Jesus has pointed out to someone that their faith was the means by which they were delivered from whatever was oppressing them. Luke chapter 7, we see it the first time where this sinful woman, and when I, when I say sinful, she was well known in that city for her sin. Right? Everyone knows what kind of woman this is. And she comes to Jesus, right, in the house of this Pharisee that Jesus is dining with, and she starts wiping his feet with oil. And she's using her hair. And she's kissing his feet. And she's weeping. And Jesus reveals why she's doing that. Because she's been forgiven much. A great sinner, well known to all. But she has received forgiveness for those sins. And he says to her, your faith has saved you. Luke chapter 8, remember the woman who comes through the crowd, right? All these people are pressing in on Jesus. And this woman, she has this, 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 uh, this disease that's causing her incessant bleeding, right? That bleeding disorder. She's hemorrhaging blood. And she knows somehow that if she can but touch the hem of Jesus' garment, she'll be healed. And what happens? That's what happens. And what does Jesus say to her? Your faith has saved you. And just a chapter ago, Luke 17, we see ten lepers, right, who come to Jesus from a distance. They cry out, have mercy on us. And Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they go, 
They're cleansed of their leprosy. And one of them turns around, realizing what has happened, and he comes back to Jesus and falls on his face, and it makes it very clear that this is not your typical person. He's a Samaritan. And Jesus says, no, what? Did I not heal ten? Where are the other nine? And he says to this man, falling on his face, who's giving glory to God, he says to him, go your way. Your faith has saved you. And then here, finally, he says this for the last time, to this blind, desperate man, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. So here's the crucial question that we need to answer. In each one of these cases, what was it about the faith of each one of these individuals that resulted in them being saved from their desperate situations? Did that faith have anything to do with the kind of person who possessed it? Right? Because it's my faith, therefore it's a really good faith. Is that what we're to draw from these different passages? Because you're going to hear a lot of people today saying, well, I have great faith. I have this life of faith. You know, my faith is really strong. Did their faith have anything to do with them? What was significant about their faith? It had nothing to do with who they were. But it had everything to do were the one in whom they were placing it. Because in each of these cases, who were they placing their faith in? They were placing it in Jesus. Every one of them put their faith in Jesus as the only one who could deliver them from their desperate situation. Only by crying out to Jesus now for this blind man could he be delivered from his darkness. Only by that expression of faith in Jesus did Jesus do for the blind man what he had asked of him. And verse 43, you see what happens immediately as a result of this man's faith in Jesus. Immediately. He received his sight. He followed Jesus, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Friends, this blind man saw the significance of Jesus. God had granted to him, you could say, the eyes to recognize who Jesus was and what Jesus alone could do. And what a wonderful illustration of what Jesus would do with the closest of his disciples who were at that moment blind to the significance of what Christ would do in Jerusalem. Right? I think we can make that connection from what Jesus had been telling his disciples and their inability to see the significance of what he's saying with what's going on in this man's life who's received sight from Jesus. Like the blind man, Jesus' closest disciples knew that he was the Messiah, but they could not comprehend how a dying Messiah could accomplish anything for his people. But in just a few days, they would understand what the death of Jesus would accomplish. Jesus' disciples would see that the Messiah who could save the sinner from her sin and the sick from her disease and the leper from his leprosy and the blind man from his darkness would through his death save many from death and through his being raised would give eternal life to all who would cry out to him in faith. And like the blind man who received his sight, following after Jesus, glorifying God, the disciples too would continue after the risen Christ to give glory to God. So as we conclude this morning, let me ask you this. 
Has God given you the eyes to see the significance of Christ? Has God helped you to comprehend just how crucial his suffering and death and resurrection is? Has God helped you to see that only Jesus can save you from the darkness of your own sin? The only way that any of us can be saved from sin and death is for God to open our eyes to recognize who Jesus truly is and what only Jesus can do and to put your faith in him. What a precious illustration of what God must do for all people if they are to be saved from their sin. God has to open their eyes. God has to help them see that they are enemies against God. They are rebels against God's law. They are sinners in the sight of a holy God. God has to do that work. And friends, as we talk with our friends and neighbors, we need to remember that. We need to recognize that the only thing we can do is to point them to Jesus. Point them to the word of God. Point them to the only place that they're going to find the truth. And pray that God will take his word and open their eyes to Jesus. And so I pray that we would do that, that we would not only have the eyes to see ourselves, the significance of Jesus every day, but that we would take what we see and help others to see the same.